have your Bibles, please open them up. I think I've told you the book of John, John chapter 11 tonight, a very familiar story to a lot of us. Uh, John chapter 11, John chapter 11. And uh, I'm, I'm just I'm excited for what God has for us. I'm going to try and make this as brief as possible. I know that will be the first miracle that will happen tonight. And uh, and because uh, I want to gather around these altars and be with you and, and watch the Lord do some amazing things as we seek him and ask him to have his way in our lives. So uh, how many are anticipating God to do something tonight? How, how many of you need a miracle in your life tonight? Come on, let's just go ahead and admit it right now. That's it. That's all right. Uh, we, we all need God. At some point, there's something that happens in every one of our lives because we live in this world. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, doesn't it? And so uh, oftentimes we need just to surrender to the Lord. I feel like I'm lopsided, so I should come over here to even things out for some reason. Uh, but um, uh, you know, you guys are all over here. Sooner or later, you know what? I, I feel the Lord. This is the word of the Lord, Pastor Dan. You need just to get rid of that section over there and make everybody come over here. I feel those chairs could just come over here. Uh, uh, but uh, that would help the sound guys out too. No, I think I just blessed the AV people. Uh, but... Uh, I believe the Lord has an amazing uh, word for each and every one of us tonight. And if you receive that word and you apply that word to your life, listen to me. The word of God does not return void. Don't listen to what I have to say. Listen to what the Lord wants to say to you tonight. And hopefully uh, something that, that, that he might say through me might stick to your spirit. And maybe as we read the scripture or something goes along the way, the Lord might drop something else in your heart. But whatever it is the Lord says to you tonight, you stand upon the promises of God's word. Amen. Praise the Lord. So John chapter 11, John chapter 11, starting at verse 17. We're just going to read the first little bit of this. We're actually going to go all the way down through verse 44 by the end of the evening. But uh, John chapter 11, verse 17. And if you would, would you stand this evening for the reading of God's word? John chapter 11, starting at verse 17. John chapter 11, starting at verse 17. I'm reading from the New International Version tonight, and this is what the Word of the Lord says on a beautiful, bright, sunshiny day. Come on, somebody. There's already, it was supposed to rain today and the sun shone. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. God's moving in Webster. John chapter 11, verse 17. And, of course, we know that Jesus had already found out that Lazarus had died, and he had stayed away. They come to tell him he was sick, and Jesus says, Listen, it's going to be for your benefit and for my glory that I wait to go there and let him die so I can come there and then God's going to do something awesome. So uh, Jesus already knew all that was going to happen and and uh, all that and we're going to talk about that in just a moment but it picks up here and as Jesus makes his way towards Bethany in verse 17 it says on his arrival Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, that's where we're getting our whole launch right there, those, those two little words, even now. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, she told him. Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Let's pray. Father, one more time, would you release the power of your written word into our lives? In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, Lord, I pray that your word would work as that double-edged sword, Lord, that it would divide, a, uh, divide uh, Lord, even the bone and the marrow that would pierce down deep into our hearts and our souls, Lord, and spur us into action. God, I pray tonight that we would not just be hearers of the word, but, God, that we would also be doers of the word as well. Thank you, Lord. I, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your, for your leading and your guiding. I thank you for your discernment. Lord, I thank you for the gifts of your spirit. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would not only just hear your voice tonight, God, but we would have enough guts to do what you ask us to do. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, come on. Amen. 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 God bless you. Look at somebody on the way down and say, it's Monday Night Miracles, Mikey. Amen. So look, 
I, I, I want you to get this with me tonight. I, I want you to say, let this sink deep down inside of you tonight. You know, Mary and Martha had lost their brother Lazarus, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it was tough. It's separation, you know, the loss of a loved one. I'm sure many of us in this room have lost a family member, if maybe not a family member yet, or a, a, a friend or someone that you know, and it was very hard. It's hard to deal with that. It's never, it's never easy to deal with the loss of a family member, whether, uh, you know, maybe be expected or unexpected along the way. Sooner or later, folks, we all deal with separation. We all deal with disappointment. We all deal uh, with, with things that, that just aren't a path that we would choose unless we were forced down that path. Come on, are you with me tonight? I don't think Mary or Martha or even Lazarus for that sake. Let's give Lazarus a little bit of better for the doubt. I doubt he chose to go into that grave on his own. Come on. There's only one person I ever know that has is, is, is willingly went and laid down his life for the entire world. And so uh, tonight I want us to look at this passage of Scripture. Uh, you know, uh, Mary and uh, Martha are there. and uh, They're grieving in Bethany, this little town, Bethany, we know. It's just about two miles outside of Jerusalem. But the funny thing is uh, they have yet to actually uh, uh, pinpoint the place of, of Bethany. Bethany was just a, bear, a blip on the radar. There was, there was a, it was hard to find. Uh, scholars have continued to argue of where this town actually was, and they're not exactly sure uh, where Bethany was around Jerusalem. It's, it's not something that... Uh, that people really know where it is. They just know here from Scripture that it was two miles outside of, out of, outside of Jerusalem. And so uh, here, here as it goes, um, uh, you know, uh, Jesus, they came to Jesus earlier in, verse 11, in chapter 11 and tell them uh, that Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, listen, uh, listen, folks, I want you to understand this tonight. Uh, Jesus looks at them and says, uh, this sickness will not end in death, he says in verse 4. No, it is for God's glory so that, uh, that God's Son may be glorified through it. Listen, I believe many of us have been down pathways in our life, even recently, uh, in, in our lives that, that we would not have chosen. But, and sometimes we question whether or not God, you know, we, we often ask this big question, this deep theological question, why do good things happen to bad, uh, or why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were some of the closest friends that Jesus had in all the world. And one of them had to die. Why do, good, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, we, we all have that. We, 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 it's hard for us to swallow that pill. I, I, don't like, I don't like having to deal. It's not comfortable for me because I know me and my, in, in the life of my wife and I, we've went through things and, and, and personally in our family and things that have happened in and around. That, listen, nobody else knows. Nobody else knows a lot of the things. That, I, 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 listen, I, I wish I had all the answers of why. I wish I knew why all this stuff happened. But Jesus here gives us one overlying principle, one large principle that goes throughout it all. But listen to me, folks, we do not always see the things in perspective the way that God sees them. God says, Jesus said here that, that, uh, that this sickness would not end in death, but it would be for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. In the very next verse, it says Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved them. And even later on, we're going to talk about how emotionally invested Jesus was in this family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But, but Lazarus went ahead and died. Folks, we are going to go through unfortunate circumstances. And it's, it's oftentimes paths that we did not choose to go down. Now, I'm not telling you tonight that God forces bad things on good people. But what I am telling you is that we have created a world in which there is sin. And because of that sin, death comes to all men. Because one man said, now everybody's going to have to die. It's staggering. The death rate remains to be thousands of years later, one to one. And that encouraging tonight. Look at somebody go, you're going to die, sucker. No, don't do that. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, it's just fact. Unless the rapture happens, you are going to die. And in literal sense, even when the rapture does happen, you are experiencing death. But I want you to get this deep down inside of you. Jesus said, this sickness, this sin, this world will not end in death but so that the Son of Man may be glorified. And I know when we're going through the problem, when a loved one passes away or a sickness or a hardship comes into our life, that is not something easy that we want to say, God, for your glory. That's hard. And I'm not here to tell you tonight that that's an easy thing. 
But what I am here to tell you tonight, it's going to be for his glory and for your benefit that God is working on your behalf right now. In Martha, it goes on as Jesus gets, as he comes to Bethany now, uh, he, gets, he gets to Bethany and, and uh, Martha comes running out to meet him. She was one of the first ones to meet him. And she says in verse 22, she sa- uh, before she gets to verse 22, she says, The Lord, if you, would be, if you would have been here, Lazarus wouldn't even have died. If you'd have been here, Lazarus wouldn't even have died. Come on, how many of you have ever been in that point in your life when something's happened and, and, you, and it's okay to be honest with the Lord. It's okay to show the Lord that sometimes, I, I, I know I, that you might be shocked by this from a preacher, but I have been angry with the Lord before. I've been upset with God. And to tell me that you never have been is the first lie that you're telling me tonight. Because I can guarantee there's been a circumstance or a situation or there's been something that has happened in your life that has caused you frustration or anger or agitation with the Lord, that that you, you question the Lord. It's okay to question God tonight. God wants us to be honest with him. There's no sense in hiding our emotions and our feelings from him. The Lord wants us to be honest with him tonight. He already knows what you're thinking, so just go ahead and tell him and be up front. Come on now. And Martha comes to Jesus. I mean, she was the first one to run out of the house. Mark, come on, I love Martha. A lot of times Martha gets a bad rap, but I love Martha. Because Martha is the first one to leave the house to come confront Jesus. The first thing wasn't to say, wasn't to say oh, I'm so happy to see you, Lord. The first thing was is, where were you? Where were, if you would have been here, he, my brother wouldn't be dead. If you would have been here, everything would have been fine. If you would have come, when I asked you to come, he, my bro- Lee would be alive right now. But have you ever prayed that prayer before? Lord, if you would have answered me the way I wanted you to answer me. Come on. If you would have answered me the way I wanted you to answer me. I never would have had to go. I never would have had to deal with this. I never would have had to go through this. It's much like what we talked about Sunday morning with those scars. Listen, we, we want God to erase the scars, and God says, "No, no, no. I want you to tell the story about the scar so that it can be for your strength and for my glory." And this is what Jesus is saying here too. She goes, "God, Lord, if you had been here, this would have never have happened." But here's the power of her statement in verse 22. But I know that even now. Man, that gets me going right now. I mean, there's something, there, there's some strength that wells up my backbone when I hear that. But I know that even now, you can give me whatever we ask. The Lord will give you whatever you ask. Tonight, I want to talk to you about even now faith. What does it mean to have even now, despite the circumstance, despite the situation, despite the sickness, despite the pain, despite the separation, despite all the garbage and the junk and the unfortunate circumstances that we have to deal with in a sinful, fallen world, despite all of that, even now, we can have the faith to believe the Lord will give us whatever we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, if you are with me tonight, if you're somebody in the room with me tonight, you say, Tim, you know what, I've been dealing with stuff, I've been dealing with heartache. I've been dealing with pain. I've been dealing with sickness. I've been dealing with death. I've been dealing with separation. I've been dealing with uncertainty. I've been dealing with pain. I've been dealing with depression. I've been dealing with with all kinds of uh, different junk that I don't even want to let everybody know, but I've been dealing with it. But tonight, I've showed up in church on a Monday night. Come on, somebody. I showed up at church on a Monday night on Hard Road in Webster, New York, and I know tonight that even now, the Lord is going to give me whatever I ask in the name that is above every name because I know at the name of Jesus cancer has to bow heart disease has to bow arthritis has to go the back of depression is broken in the name that is above every name come on and his name is Jesus Woo! that gets me going tonight I know that even now Deb I hope you brought a raincoat because I'm spitting hard tonight I know you better look at her I love Deb. I put Deb through everything. Man, I feel so bad for you. I'm sorry. I love you. Listen. I believe tonight we can have even now faith. Deb, you have even now faith. You do. You've been through a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff you haven't even shared with everybody yet because you've been ashamed of it. But you know even now God's going to give you whatever you ask. God's going to give you whatever you ask. You've been through, you guys, you've been through stuff. Brother, you've been, God, you've been praying for God to heal your voice for how long? But I believe tonight, even now, God can still do it. 
You've been praying, come on, you've been praying for God to take away that heart disease, but I know that even now, I know God can still do it. Come on, somebody. I believe even now. I believe even now. I believe even now. Man, I cannot get past this tonight even now. What does it mean to have even now faith? Let me do this so I can, we can get the. Look at this now. She says, Lord, for four days, for four days in verse 17, he's already been dead. He's been in the tomb for four days. For four days, he's been dead. Listen, what's it mean to have even now faith? How do you exercise even now faith? We all know what faith is, right? Let me first, let's make sure we're all standing on the same playing field. We're all singing from the same hymn tonight. Faith, if you ever want to know the definition of a word and the definition is clearly given in the Bible, just go with that definition and don't worry about everything else, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for or the evidence of things not seen. In other translations, it says being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. It's believing without seeing. It's knowing that you know that you know that even now God's still going to give it to you because you're going to ask in Jesus' name. So how do we exercise this even now faith? First of all, you need to declare your faith. You need to declare your faith, both vocally you know, both verbally and physically, you need to declare your faith. Martha came running out to him. She heard that Jesus was coming in verse 17. And on, on, as Jesus gets, a, a, it wasn't even into the house yet, not even into the town of Bethany yet. Uh, and when Martha had heard in verse 20, it says, when Martha had heard Jesus was coming, she went out. She went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. She went out to meet him. Folks, if you want to declare your faith, you need to be aggressive about it. I'm sick and tired. I, I, I love you, and I said, can I just be flat out honest with you and speak to you in the terms I, 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 you know, that I understand? You all right with me tonight? I'm sick and tired of limp-wristed faith. I'm, I'm so tired of Christians that sit around and just give, oh, if, Lord, if it's your will, I'm tired of people praying that. That's garbage. That's, that's, that's like saying, oh, Lord, uh, I guess, you know, I, you, you've given, even though Jesus said all authority under heaven and earth is given to him and he now gives it to us, that we have the power to speak into existence even though they're not, that we can call them as though they are. But we go, oh, God, if it's your will. Listen, it's, it's his will that you be who God has called you to be and exercise the measure of faith that he has given you to actually call things, to actually live out, to actually walk in faith. Not so, God, if it's your will, do you think it's not his will to bless you? He will not withhold any good gift from his kids. It's not, it's his will to bless you. It's his will to heal you. It's his will to deliver you. He wants you to prosper even as your soul prospers. He wants you to prosper physically, financially, mentally, spiritually, even as your soul prospers. You don't believe me? Read it in the book of John's. Come on, somebody. We, we want to get, we want to act like this is something we want to shrink back because we want to have an excuse for when things don't go the way we want them to go. Here's the deal, folks. When you are in line with the power of the Holy Spirit and you do what he tells you to do exactly when he tells you to do it, not 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later or a week later after you think about it, he doesn't need you to think about it. He needs you to do it. Declare your faith. Martha was aggressive. She, she ran out to get him. She went out to the Lord. She was aggressive in her faith. And then it says in verse 31, Martha comes to him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen, even though she was disappointed, she was repressed, not only was she aggressive, but she was persistent. She didn't let anything keep her. Not her emotions. Not other people's opinion, because we know that other, everybody else in the house was saying, oh, here comes Jesus, he's the one that let us down. If that joker had been here a few days earlier, we wouldn't have been in this problem. If he'd have answered our prayer a week earlier, we wouldn't have had this situation. But see, none of them were in, were in line with the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God was obviously speaking to Jesus to wait. Come on. And she comes out and she goes, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But she still went to him, didn't she? Despite her questions, despite her disappointment, despite her feeling repressed and, and let down, she persisted. Be aggressive, be persistent. And then she says, and listen, watch this now, in verse 22, she says, but even now, but I know, but I know. Do you hear the certainty in that? 
There is no wavering. There, there, there's no questioning. There's no, there's no room for error. Listen to me, folks. If you leave room for error, you will commit error. Leave no room for error. Leave no wiggle room. Don't go to the left or to the right, but stay dead center right down the path God has for you. Don't, 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 don't wait for an escape route. Don't have something, well, if this doesn't work out, we can fall back onto this. That's not faith. That's not faith. I'm not telling you not to be wise and not to be prepared and all that kind of stuff. But listen to me, folks. When God tells you to do something, listen to me. You've got to be like Martha and say, but I know that even now, do you hear the certain? There's no questioning. There, there's no doubt. There's no fear. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus says in verse 23, but your brother will rise again. <laughs> your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, all of a sudden, here goes the Christian again. Here's the Christian again. Jesus is saying, your brother will rise again. He's standing there saying, your brother will rise again. And what does she do? She immediately gives a way out. She be immediately begins to try and leave room for error in case Jesus can't perform a miracle here. She goes, I know that at the last day, he'll rise again. That's not wrong, right? I mean, she's right. She's right. But don't, don't use some theological process in your mind, something that you've created in your little religious mind to come up with an excuse for God not to perform his word right now. Uh-oh. This is what we do. This is what we want to give God an excuse not to do it right now. We want to give God a way out. And God's saying, I know he's going to rise. He will rise again. Is this, is this with any, am I talking to anybody in the room tonight? This challenges me. This gets me going. Look at what Jesus says, but I am, in verse 25, I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Listen to me. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? This Greek word for belief is called pistuo. It's, 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 it's not just saying you believe, because anybody can say it. The book of James says that demons believe in God. That didn't work out too well for them, did it? You can walk down the streets of just about any town in our country and ask people if they believe in God, and 90% of them will say yes. They believe in God. To believe is one thing. But this active, this belief is an act of faith. It's, it's, it's with the implication that action is going to follow the deep inward commitment. That belief, you know, you know that even now. It's not just declaring it, but listen to me, it's now doing it. It's not just declaring it, it's now doing it. Look, look, as, look at this goes on now. And, and after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside in verse 28. She says, the teacher is here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Maybe God's calling you tonight. Maybe God's asking for you. You're going to sit in your seat and try and reason it out why he's not talking to you? Or are you going to get up quickly and run to him? Whew. That's a challenge for somebody in this room tonight. You know, just a, few, uh, a couple years ago, I was preaching out in Ohio. In, in, in uh, Worcester, Ohio, and uh, uh, I, I was there on a, uh, we set up our stuff and everything on Saturday, kind of like we did here, and then went to the hotel and slept there, and, and I had had some pizza. Uh, I had some pizza uh, Saturday night, and, uh, you know, I had sausage and bacon and all that kind of good, you know, not that thin crust stuff. I want that deep dish thing. That way, when you bite into it, you can feel the grease going up over your gums. Come on, somebody. And uh, I can hear my arteries clogging up when I eat it. And uh, you know, I, I said, and so I kind of had a little bit of heartburn that night or whatever because the junk I put in my body, and, and uh, uh, the Lord's delivered me from that since then. But anyway, that night I'm, I'm sleeping and whatever, and the Lord wakes me up in the middle of the night. And I, I, I clearly heard the voice of the Lord say there was going to be somebody there tomorrow that had lost the function of their right kidney, and God was going to restore it. So I'm like, hmm. Interesting. So I roll over and grab the little pad that they put on the nightstand beside the, you know, beside you on the, uh, in the hotel, and I write it down so I didn't forget because I know who I am. And, uh, I, you know, and then I rolled over and went right back to sleep. 
That was it. Woke up the next morning. I remembered it again. I rolled over, looked at the pad. Yep, sure enough, same thing. And I thought, boy, I don't. I wonder if it was the what, the pizza I ate, or you know, like I, I don't know, that woke me up or whatever. But the, it's in my mind. So I got up, wasn't preaching on healing that morning or anything like that. But I woke up that morning and I, I stood up there. We sang our little song or whatever, did our little thing, and and uh, it just said out to said to somebody. I said, uh, listen, the Lord. Uh, I feel the Lord's given me this tonight. Somebody here has lost the uh, the function of the right kidney, and if that's you, uh, the Lord wants to restore it. And that's basically what they did, too. They stared at me just like what you just did. They just went, you know, like, I'm like, must have been the, must have been the pizza, right? I thought, okay, whatever. And I went on with my business, and I preached and did the whole thing and called people forward and were praying with people or whatever, going down the line. And finally, uh, we're getting towards the end of the, uh, the, the morning. I was done praying with people, and this little lady, uh, an elderly lady, comes over, and she, you know, she's about yay tall, and she starts, I'm praying with somebody here and just kind of finishing or whatever and wiping the spit and sweat off of me and all that because I tend to do that. And, and she takes a hold of my jacket and starts tugging like this. First of all, don't do that. Okay, <laughs> don't do that. She says, she says, uh, Brother Tim, you know, don't focus. I love that. Brother Tim, she says, Brother Tim, I think you were talking to me. Yeah, I was pretty much, pre- everybody in here, I was kind of preaching at him. Yeah, I, I guess so, you know, and I didn't know. At, by that time, I'd forgotten about the kidney deal. And she goes, no, I had lost the function of my right kidney. But when you said that this morning, I wasn't sure if you were talking to me. Let me give you the Hubbard. <laughs> right? The spirit of slap come all over me, you know? Like I, I wanted to quickly lay hands on this woman, you know? But I, I said, well, I said, well, sure, I'll, well, let, let's pray and, you know, whatever. And we prayed, you know what, God still healed her and everything right there. It was awesome. And I told you that story because just a month ago, I told that story, just like I told you. And in the middle of telling that story, I felt the Lord say, there's somebody here with this that right kidney. I told him that whole story. And they looked at me just like that, just like you're doing again. Right? And, they, and so it went through the whole deal and the whole thing again. You would not believe it. This little old lady comes up. Don't do that. She goes, I wasn't sure if it was me, but I've lost the function of my right kidney. I've had enough. When the Lord is calling you, get up quickly and go to him. I told you all that to say that. The Lord's calling you tonight. The Lord might give someone, me, somebody else, who knows whatever's going on. The Lord might give you a word or might, might give you something of encouragement. Or you're wondering whether or not God is talking to you. Can I just clear it all up right now? Yes. Yes. See, because I believe, listen to me, I believe this. I believe that many of us hear the voice of God, but most of us don't have the backbone, don't have the guts to do what he asks us to do. I believe many of us hear God calling us, but most of us want to stay in the house because it's comfortable in there. Everybody's mourning with us. Everybody feels bad with us. And we can get on the prayer chains that way, and people can talk about us, and people will come and ask us how we're doing. All, All of a sudden, I'm getting real now, right? Because we love being the victim. We love having something wrong with us. So people will talk about us. So people will be on the floor. I got news to you, folks. You were on the forefront of God's mind when he was dying on that tree. You were on the forefront of God's mind when he got up out of the tomb. I got news to you today. You don't have to worry about whether or not people are thinking about you or that you're loved or you're forgotten. The Lord showed you his love while you were still a sinner, while you were still laid up in that hospital bed. Listen to me. The Lord is with you every step of the way. And tonight, he is calling you out by name name. Come out of the house. Come out of feeling sorry for yourself. From Come out from being victimized. Come out from feeling like the whole world is against you. Tonight, run to Jesus and you are going to find the miracle. If you would step out and even now faith, declare your faith and work in your faith. Don't just sit back, but I dare you tonight in the name of the Lord, I dare you to run to my Jesus because he'll heal you. He'll save you. He'll deliver you. He'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Come on somebody. I serve a risen Savior tonight who is strong to save. Don't sit back and wonder of whether or not this is for you. Yes. Yes, I'm talking to you. Come on, somebody. I wasn't even in my message. How you like that? Now I got to go through all this. Lord, help me, Jesus. 
Mary had lost her brother, but she left everybody and left everything to run to Jesus. Mm, let's get that. Yeah, get, pick that up. Good, okay. Run down to verse 33 with me real quickly. When Mary went running, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died, right? We heard that before from Martha, so no big news. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Shortest verse in all the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Listen. Here's the reason why you need to do your faith, why you, why you need to actively be involved in your faith and you need to run to Jesus tonight. Because, listen, he is emotionally invested in you. He deeply cares for you tonight. Look at, look at what this says here. When he found out, when he saw Mary and her sister and all those that were grieving and were so upset and were weeping, the Bible says, that, and he saw all of them weeping who came along with him, he was deeply moved in verse 33. It says he was deeply moved. He was deeply moved. You know, if you, if I, I love going back, I'm not, not a Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I love studying the language that this, that this book was written in, the New Testament. And, and I study this, this particular deeply moved, and this really strikes it with me, and or strike, it gets a chord with me because this was actually a farming term. It's a deeply moved. How is that a farming term? To be it's actually specific about it, it was an equestrian term. It was about a horse. A horse is a horse, of course. It, it, it's actually this deeply moved is, is, is what they would say when a horse would give the snort, when it would get the... <laughs> you better put that raincoat on, Dad. You know, that, that, you know how, how many have ever been around a horse or even a larger animal, a cow or, or whatever, and you, you hear him give the little... <laughs> you know what that tells me? You better get away. You, you better step back for just a few moments. You, you better move away from this. this. This was frustration the Lord was showing. He was upset at this. He, he, he saw all these people grieving. They were de- he wasn't upset with them. He was upset that we have to live in this fallen world. He was upset that his children, that his sons and his daughters and his brothers and his sisters, his heirs and his joint heirs have to, and we have to put up with this stuff because we live in this world that we've messed up. Come on, if every parent in the room would understand what I'm telling you right now. How many have ever been around your kids are sick or somebody's going through something and you've been, you have even prayed the prayer, Lord, put it on me instead of them. Come on. God, I, take it off. I'd rather have it. That's what the Jesus was he was upset he was frustrated he wasn't mad at them he was mad at the sickness Jesus was sick and tired of you being sick and tired then it goes on to say he was troubled in verse 33 he was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled again this is agitation it moves from frustration now to agitation he's starting to get angry He's starting to get angry. The sea was angry that day, my friends. Like an old man trying to send soup back in a deli. He was upset. He was not happy. He was not good. Listen, he was, he was starting to get angry with this. You say, the Lord can get angry? Yeah, because listen, you can get angry and not sin. Look back whenever he got upset with people in the temple and threw them out. Righteous indignation, right? He's upset. I know Pastor Dan had mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about it a little bit at the very end, but he had mentioned how the Lord is, is, is gentle and he will, not, he will not storm his way in. But listen to me, once you invite him in and you give him permission to come in, I got news for you. He takes over. When you give him, he will take over. He's a gentleman and he will not force his way in. But listen to me, when you say, Lord, have your way, you better be careful because he will. He will. He even says in, 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 what is it, in, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, he says, the kingdom of God advances forcibly. Other translations say takes, a, the uh, kingdom of God advances in violence. 
Do we don't listen? God does not sit back when we when we uh, uh, yield ourselves to the Lord. The Lord comes into our life and He gets frustrated with the sickness, with the pain, with the, with the, with the evilness that we have to deal with in this world. And He sits back and He gets. Listen, I'm telling you something. The Lord gets angry with it. He's emotionally invested in you. And then it gets to the point in verse 35 where it says, and Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Listen to me tonight. It wasn't like, woo! You know, one of those deals, right? You know them people that, that get that going, right? They, they you know, I, I love, there are certain times, you know, I understand where we get remorseful. And we, <laughs> you know, we, we get all that stuff going with us, and we, we want to make a big deal about everything, but it had nothing to do with that at all. It wasn't Jesus making a scene. He was, he, he was so emotional. How many have ever been so angry and so upset? Tears started to stream down your face. That's what it was at this point. God looked, Jesus was there. Because you've got to remember, he knitted you together in your mother's womb. You were fearfully and wonderfully made in the eyes of the Lord. And when people start messing with his kids, he cares for you. Cast all your cares on him. Because he cares for you. He cares for you. Jesus, he'd had enough. Can you believe that's only one page? He'd had enough. He had enough. He said, move away the stone. This ends right now. Move away the stone. What stones do you need to move away for God to work? Unbelief, fear, doubt, some religious scheme, some way that you think the Lord had to do it just this way because you know how the Lord always works? Come on, folks. I don't know. Listen, God works in ways all the time I've never seen him work before. I guarantee you it's always within the confines of this book, but I got news for you. I don't know everything there is to know about this book yet. I've studied. I've done everything I know I should do, spent all kinds of money. Listen, I've done it, but I, there's still things. You say, how do you... Let me explain to you this. How many of you have ever read a verse? You've read that verse a hundred times. And all of a sudden, that hundred and first time, you read something, you saw, I've never seen that before. Come on, how many are with me right now? If that hasn't happened for you, it tells me you've never been reading, the, you haven't been reading the Bible enough. God will do more than what you could ever ask, imagine, or think. Declare your faith. Do your faith. And now it's time to desert death. Desert death. Get away from it. Jesus comes over to them. Uh, look at this now in verse 40. Jesus comes over. He says, move away the stone. And in verse 40, it says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of my people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. I love John. He's so messed up. I'll tell you why. Just say. He says, the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and the cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. When he calls you out of darkness, why stay in the tomb? He's been calling you by name. He's been calling you to step out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He's been calling you to desert death. And I believe many of us in this room, and I would assume on a Monday night, I believe many of us have walked out of that tomb. But here's the deal. A lot of us have kept the grave clothes on. A lot of us have kept the grave clothes on. Let me explain to you why. Many of you would believe, right? John, the writer of this book, a 
man of God. Y'all with me? He's a man of God. He's somebody that has walked with the Lord. He's seen God do amazing, uh, all kinds of crazy things. Obviously, he was one of the first ones. Uh, him and Peter were one of the first ones to get to the tomb that morning when Jesus was awake, you know, when, when Jesus got up from the grave. He, I mean, he's amazing, amazing faith. John has amazing faith. Y'all with me? But uh, let me show you what just happens. In verse 43, when Jesus called in with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Can I stop right there? Can I pause what I'm telling you for just a second? Put that on pause. Can you do that? Just put your thumb in that thought. Okay. Many scholars believe the reason Jesus said Lazarus come out because these tombs, listen to me, these tombs weren't one room tombs. They weren't like a little hole in the ground. These were caves. And back in these caves were many, many little shoot offs and areas and places they have hewn out of the, out of the stone. There were multiple dead people in those caves. You understand that? There's more than one dead person in this cave. And if Jesus just would have opened up that cave and said, come out, you would have had all kinds of dead people walking out of there. I'm serious. Jesus is specific. You want to know why? Because it was the family of Lazarus that came to Jesus. Just because you think your family member's dead doesn't mean you don't have the chance to keep going to Jesus cry out for your family member in front of the Lord because he'll stand in front of that tomb and he'll call them out John come out Isaac come out Mark come out Mary come out Jesus stands at the tomb at Lazarus tomb and says Lazarus come out out walks Lazarus right I love this because the people they, when Jesus told him to move away the stone Mary and Martha look at him and go but Lord he's been in there four days folks when you're dead in the desert for four days, can I just tell you something right now? You are going to stink. Can I just, is, is that gross to you? But I, I mean, think about this. There's no embalming fluid or any of that stuff happening right now. He's in a hot desert, dead. Let a dead groundhog lay outside of your front yard for a couple of days and tell me how it works. It stinks. In fact, I love, anybody have a King James Bible? Anybody got a King James Bible in here? Look, look, look at your King James Bible right now because I love, I, I love, you know, I, I was born and raised King Jimmy. I love King Jimmy. That's 1611 English. I love that. You know, a lot of the scripture I quote is from the King Jimmy Bible. I, I do. I, I, I think the poetic scripture and throughout the Psalms and the Proverbs, I love King Jimmy uh, English. I really do. But it was, I mean, understand King Jimmy wasn't there thousands of years ago. It was written in 1611. You're all with me, right? But the King Jimmy says, this, this, is, my, this is my favorite part in verse, at, at the end, in verse 39. They say, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. The King James says, but Lord, he doth stinketh. That is one of the best, that's one of the best verses in all the Bible. But Lord, he doth stinketh. He doth stinketh. <laughs> Jesus calls him out. Here's why John is so messed up. Because Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb. He comes walking out of the tomb. And in verse 44, he says, the dead man came out. Do you all get that? Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb. And John says... The dead man came out. Hello. Four of you are getting it. Come on. Jesus brings Lazarus back to life. Performs divine CPR. Come out. Lazarus comes out. And John says, the dead man came out. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a dead man walk in my life. He wasn't dead. But we do this in religious circles, don't we? We do this in church. We want to label ourselves by something that happened in the past. We want to say, oh, you're the divorced one. Oh, you're the addict. You're, 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 the, you're the failure. You're the one that went bankrupt. You're the, you're, you're the one. You're the liar. You're, you're, you're this. You're the, you're the one. We always want to say, oh, this is what, this, it's going to be you that's going to, let, you're going to walk around with that scarlet letter around the neck, your neck for the rest of your life. When Jesus calls you out of the tomb, he doesn't only just call you out of the tomb, but he says, listen, take 
those grave clothes off and let him go. It is for freedom that Jesus has set you free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. There is joy. You don't have to live by the label of the past anymore. The circumstances and the situations and the temporary pain of this world do not dictate who you are. You are an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are no longer dead. You have now been made alive by the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. That ought to get something deep down inside of you. You are not labeled by the failure. You're not labeled by the sickness. You're not labeled by the pain anymore. But Jesus loves you, and he's been standing at the edge of your tomb saying, come out, come out, come out. And when you come out, listen, desert death. Have no intention of going back. Why do you want to go back in there? It stunk in there. Come on, somebody. Get rid of all the get rid of all the remnants of it. Get rid of all the pain. Get, get rid of a, a feeling like, uh, like, like that's who you were. That's not you anymore. You're alive. Take those grave clothes off because they doth stinketh. You're alive forevermore. Come on, would you stand with your uh, to your feet tonight? Hallelujah. That's all I was to say. Jesus comes. Let me give you a little secret of how this is going to work tonight. This is how he did this in verse 41 before he calls him out of the tomb. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. I thank you that you hear me because I know you always hear me. I thank you that you hear me. Listen, tonight, you need a miracle in your body. You need a miracle. You need a healing. You need a touch from the Lord. There's been death come into your life, uh, whether it's by sickness or pain. Listen, I, I, I'm not telling you this. Uh, folks, we just need to be thankful because he always hears us. He always, he always hears us. He always hears us. Jesus' words were thankful, and they were brief, and they were direct. I told you Sunday morning, when you speak to a demon... Listen, only speak once because that's all you have to do. It Because all authority, Jesus says in Matthew 28, that all authority has been given to him and he now gives to you. Go and make disciples. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Pistuo. Those who believe. In my name, you'll drive out demons. You'll speak in new languages. You'll lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. If, you're, if, if you drink any deadly poison or you get bit by a snake, it won't hurt you at all. Because God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. That authority is with you. That authority, listen, that, 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 that authority, that exousia, that, that, that's that Greek word for authority, that exousia, that it, it means to, uh, that, that you strip off, that you disarm the enemy. You have the authority to disarm the enemy. Colossians, oh, I, let me, I got to read this to you. Oh, Lord. Colossians, where is that? Colossians 2, I think. Go eat popcorn. Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. That's how I remember those little books. I'm sorry. You'll remember it from that one too. Watch. Watch this. Watch, 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 watch. Colossians, here it is. Colossians 2, verse 13 through 15 says, When you were dead. Man, I didn't even know how good you were. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your, un, of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And watch this. Verse 15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the power of the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you have eaten or drank in regard to a religious festival. These are a shadow of the things that come. To the reality of ever, it is found in Jesus Christ. 
The Lord had disarmed the enemy. Look, he has disarmed the powers and the authorities. He made a public, a public spect, a spectacle of them, triumphing them over by the power of the cross. You have the authority of Jesus Christ to disarm the enemy. You have the authority in Jesus Christ to speak to that spirit of infirmity that has been chasing you down for months. And listen, you want to know why? You want to know why the doctors can't find anything wrong with you, but you still have all those problems? Because there isn't anything physically wrong with you. There is a spiritual attack coming against you. I'm not telling you that the enemy can come and possess you, but I'm telling you the enemy can come and try and oppress you, try and bring pain and confusion and doubt and fear. But I got news to you. My Lord is not the author of doubt and confusion and fear. My Lord hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind because you have the authority to disarm the enemy because the Lord made a public spectacle of him by the power of the work of the cross. He is defeated. You are alive. You are victorious in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. I dare you to lift your hands right now and begin to thank God. Begin to thank him that he's made you alive. Begin to thank him that he set you free. You are healed. You're delivered. You're set free. Come out of the tomb in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh God, I thank you that you hear me. I thank you that you hear me. You always hear me, God. Oh, I bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. 